Good evening or good morning, good afternoon from wherever you're logging in from today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And thank you to Horacis and Frank Jurgen Richter for inviting us to be here. It's a great pleasure to chair this panel. We'll be talking on the post-postmodernism as the response to the pandemic, um, looking at new forms of artistic expressions that have come out of this testing period, not least due to the pandemic, but other challenges like climate change and geopolitical and social upheavals. Um, we'll also be exploring the zeitgeist of this new emerging art movement, if one can call it that, and assess how it impacts society on a more uh, global level. Our panel today, which I'm super grateful for having, comprises a fantastic group of talented professionals from the creative field in alphabetical order. I'll introduce all of them and we can dive into, into our um, discussion. Owen Duffy is the director of the Ye Art Gallery at St. John's University. Prior to this position, he has worked at the Museum of Arts and Design, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and Virginia Commonwealth University, from where he earned his PhD as well. He has published widely on a diverse set of topics with such publications as Art Forum, BOM, Art and Education, Freeze, Art Review, and the Journal of Curatorial Studies. Since then, he has organized exhibitions internationally, and his curatorial projects have been featured in the Washington Post, New York Times, Art Forum, Art in America, among other outlets. He's currently working on a forthcoming book about Anish Kapoor's early work with Lund Humphreys. Jessica Lanay is an art writer, poet, libertist, and short fiction writer. She is a frequent contributor to Bomb Magazine as well, where she interviewed artists such as Elena Tsui, Howardena Pindel, and Rikret Tirabani. It, among others. Her poetry can be found in Poesis, Poet Laura, Indiana Review, The Common um, Pank, uh, Prairie Shoes, Kuna, and others. Her short fiction can be found in Taoma Literary Review, D uh, Duende, and Black Candies. She's a 2018 recipient of Pushcart Prize for her poem Milk, Milk, Milk that appeared in the normal uh, school. Her debut poetry collection, Amphibian, won the 2020 Naomi Long Magic uh, Poetry Prize from Broadside Lotus Press, judged by Toy Derricote. Uh, Zurich born, London based Andrea Hassler holds an MA Fine Art from Chelsea College of Art and Design. Her wax and mixed media sculptures are characterized by a tension between attraction and repulsion, depicting the emotional body often working with skin as the physical element that divides the cell from the other. She exhibited widely in the US and Europe, the most recent of which was the Verbia 3D Foundation uh, in New York following their residency project. Current projects include the group show Raum der Lusten at uh, Raum Utrecht in Netherlands, together with Atelier van Lieshout uh, and Martin Bas. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing something. Future projects include a solo show at Zurwand uh, during Art Basel in Switzerland and a site-specific installation in Marfa, Texas, planned for autumn next year, 22. Hallie McNeil, Brooklyn-based, uh, artist and writer. She received her BA from Bennington College and her MFA from the Department of Sculpture and Extended Media at Virginia Commonwealth University. Past exhibitions include solo shows at weekend projects, The Fort and Dab Oak. She has written for BOM and Looky Looky and currently teaches at Pratt Institute. Her practice is essayistic in its intentions in that she primarily works within the installation format because of its ability to bring together a range of elements such as sculpture, sound, video, text, smell, to create a psychological space that evokes or frames a narrative. She's particularly interested in exploring how desire and aspiration shape our relationships with language and material cultures through the ways uh, choose to represent ourselves through our clothes, uh, decorative decisions, speech patterns, and choice of slang. Brandon Sword is an artist, writer, and doctoral candidate at the University of Chicago who lives and works in Los Angeles. He was shortlisted for Despite International's Literary Prize and was an honorable mention and finalist for the New Millennium Writing Awards. He's won, he's won residencies at uh, Hambitch Center, sorry, the Institute for LGBTQ Plus Studies, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts and Western Montana Creative Initiatives, alongside many others. His first solo show, How the West Was Lost, opens at Stonehouse Art Gallery in October 21, and his group exhibitions include The Long Dream at the MCA Chicago, a series of small gesture, gestures at small uh, Smart Museum, and With All Our Might at the Car Center Contemporary. His words can be read in Flash Art, Bomb, Full Bleed, Hyperallergic, Chicago Review, alongside many other publications. 
And finally, we have Pittsburgh artist Scott Turi, who interprets an excess of technology and the erosion of private life in an ever-growing public world in his work. He draws upon ephemeral visual sources that may or may not be recognizable, such as a, raster, a rasterized image of lake water, along with invented linear and shape-like forms. The process of making the paintings is an integral part of his practice. He's shown widely across the U.S. with most recent solo shows at Laura Massaro's Gallery at West Virginia. University and Kip Gallery at the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Tourist work was also displayed in group shows at the Pittsburgh Center for the Arts, Huntington Museum of Art, Westmoreland Museum of American Art, and American Jewish Museum. And he was also awarded at the Experimental Film Fest last year in Oklahoma. A quick apologies for bastardizing all of your CVs because we had to, you know, obviously keep keep to the to the um, to the allocated time. So. There's plenty more that all of you have done, so um, I just wanted to kind of like shorten it to as as, as little as possible. But so to dive in, um, I want to open up with, um, I guess, your all of your um, understanding of what this kind of new reality is. Um, what does it look like? How different is it um, to really lay out basically the landscape as we see it today? Jessica, maybe you can kind of start off and then everyone else can chime in if you can. Sure thing. Also, the six degrees of separation, Scott, before I came to Bloomington to do my PhD in art history, I lived in Pittsburgh. And I think I just recalled one of my co-workers has a piece of yours in their office. So um, that was a wonderful. I kept listening to your bio. Oh, oh, that's, oh, oh. <laughs> that's very interesting. Nice. But, um, I think that we're at a we're at a we're at a very right now. Um, Never before, at least in my 34 years, have I seen a moment where socially, politically, and artistically, we're kind of at this opening moment that has like a quickly closing door. Because I think what COVID has done is that COVID has shown us the capacity of institutions to make resources more available to artists, to, you know, everyday people living when it comes to having like Zooming, you know, like world renowned artists all over the world instead of having to physically be in a privileged location. And so I think that what we're dealing with in this new reality is multiple realities meeting, which means multiple kinds of times, culturally, individually meeting. And we're also looking at what the possibilities are and what's gonna happen to all of the access to these different resources, access to one another. What's, what's gonna happen to that once we return to normal? And how are we going to deal with the fact that our access, just especially in like the Western world, depending on intersections of race, class, gender, and sexuality, what is that going to mean for people being willing to step back in to a feeling of being oppressed or not having access to certain resources? What, 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 how are artists going to feel about all of a sudden not having a platform to intervene in conversations that have to do with their certain timeline, cultural, social representation. Because I think one thing that's increased during COVID, ironically enough, because of the internet is contact. So I have a much wider range of people. But one thing that we haven't learned how to do as people live in the West, like, like Europe, United States, certain places in Latin America, is we haven't learned how to really be together without trampling on or intervening in someone else's story as well. So we are kind of at this very fruitful space. And I don't, I don't think that we, as kind of like a, like a Western epistemological reality as a unit, right, connected to a certain kind of history, are really clear yet about whether or not we are going to fight to maintain the new resources we've recently been given, given access to in terms of, you know, art, politics, culture, um, intellectualities and intellectual fields in the world, or if we are going to allow ourselves to be put back in the position where we had to fight for it anyway. Like, are we gonna take the opening or, or are we not? And I think that that's how I feel what I've read doing my own research and work, which focuses primarily in um, black radical feminism and the arts in the African diaspora. Scott, yeah, you wanna go ahead? Well, I think, um, well, you touched on obviously a lot of important things. Uh, Jessica, but the, the one thing that sort of piqued my interest is this idea that you're right. I think communication has opened up dramatically. And I think that artists um, can sort of now function outside of maybe the traditional art world in a lot of ways. 
I think it's it's obvious that artists can function without galleries, without museums potentially. And so that will open up, I think, a kind of more egalitarian space potentially for artists. And, um, you know, it, I think that's something that was gained through the pandemic. And I think it can definitely go forward as far as institutions allowing it or sort of promoting or providing resources. I mean, we'll, we'll I guess we'll find out about that. But I think that uh, I think that artists and individuals can do a lot outside of those institutions as well. And if they if that they don't continue to provide resources, I still think that artists can can function in this new sort of world, a screen sort sort of more screen based world, if you if you will. So. I, f I follow on to what um, Jessica and Scott said. I also think in terms of, it's almost like a sort of a reset button has been pressed and everyone had the time during, you know, the pandemic in various lockdowns to sort of really assess not just where they want to go with their work, but how do they want to work or, you know, with the structure of galleries and museum shows being cancelled to then still, A, still making the work, but also finding new ways of exhibiting it. So be it outdoors, be it with, you know, on online platforms, but a sort of a reset of how the structure, and as Scott said, it's a, it feels it could be the beginning of a much more equalized, um, yeah, starting point by, by sort of deconstructing the classic, um, art, art system in terms of the galleries and museums. I'm not quite sure, Jessica, when you mentioned the resources. Maybe that's an American thing, because I have to say, in Europe, I don't feel that there's been resources been made available, particularly at this point in time. If anything, um, there's more cuts of resources than resources being made available. I mean, I, I, think, I think that in the United States in, in particular, what's happened is that um, major library systems that are supposed to be like public for people who like live in the state but may not have access based on where they live or um, institutions like universities, they began this mass digitizing project and so many other kind of um, like online libraries have just kind of started buying the rights to so many texts and just pushing them out to the public to make them available. Yeah. And I think students have always done the radical thing where they're like, oh, if my friend's an artist and they need this article about, you know, this rare art form, I'm mm -hmm. going to print the articles and, and funnel it to them. And I think that there's been an uptick in that. And so mm -hmm. before when students would ask for this or when just people who are like the public would ask for these things, the libraries would be like, oh, it's too hard to get. Oh, it's very rare. Oh, well, we haven't digitized it yet. But all of a sudden, because they want to charge the fees, they make things available um, and they make them publicly available um, as well. So that's like specifically what I'm like relating to yeah. that, under those terms, right? But information is power and having access to old art books that are rare or old catalogs that only have a specific run becoming digitized, that's amazing for art historians such yeah. as myself and I imagine lots of artists. For anyone, yeah. Thanks for clarifying. Uh, I I mean, I, I agree with you in certain ways, Jessica, but I think that's also really biasing people who whose resources are specifically textual or you know, things that can be digitized. You can't digitize a CNC that I need to use to make something. I, there, I think there's been a real, like for me specifically during this past year, there was a real reorganization of what I could make in my studio. And that really shifted my practice. And in some ways, in a really, really great ways, I think there, there was a kind of um, new question of autonomy in terms of like, what can I alone in the studio with very little facilities make that will still feel like meaningful work within the larger scope of my practice and not some sort of like womp womp COVID art feeling. Um, but, you know, at the same time coming out of it, I think trying to think about like how to sort of navigate this back and forth with like a new kind of autonomy within the studio. But then also realizing like there are some resources and facilities that maybe shouldn't be so difficult to access as an artist. I mean, I was uh, meeting with a friend the other day who runs a, a magazine and is working on work for a solo show coming up in September. And she was like, do you know where I can 3D print a ceramic 
piece for this piece that I'm trying to make. It's like, I really don't actually like it, you know, it seems it's such an easy thing theoretically to have a file and be able to print it, but it's actually incredibly difficult sometimes to do these little things. And I'm, I mean, I'm running into this issue right now because I need to fix a piece that's broken for an upcoming show at the center for book arts. And I don't have a welder and it's such a pain in the ass to get a welder. And it's such a simple thing, you know, if you have the right access, but I, I so I guess I, I think there are still issues of access that, that could be improved upon. And I suppose, yeah, they're very niche, like the need for a welder. But I, I mean, in terms of making art and having a studio practice, it, it really does change what is and what isn't possible. So I, I think there's still room, even if in a very specific way. Also, sorry, there's a massive thunderstorm going on behind me and my dog is so stressed out and pacing and it's kind of making me stressed out, but I, it might be. It's all good. We can't hear anything. Um, Owen, did you did you want to say anything as well? Yeah, I think just uh, in terms of how artists are going to operate moving forward, I can speak specifically as someone who's based in New York primarily, as someone who works in an institution. And I'm personally really interested not in how necessarily artists are responding to the times in terms of specifically subject matter, though I think that can be very fascinating and enlightening, but how artists are, are almost structurally responding. Like, how can you make art? during this past year when life was so challenging for so many, when we were, you know, inundated with, of course, uh, tragedies um, through media or tragedies that we personally experienced ourselves. So I'm, I'm really interested in sort of how artists are, from a material perspective, from a process perspective, how are they adapting and how that might change art um, in ways that maybe aren't necessarily so overt and so um, clear cut. And also thinking about this in relationship to the topic of the panel, the idea of a post-postmodernism. Um, I think something that um, perhaps we might see as a result of 2020 um, from different perspectives and something that's definitely been in the works in the art scene for quite a while is I think something that is maybe slowly starting to um, become less relevant is, you know, this idea of amb ambivalence or ambiguity. I mean, I think there definitely are some ways that artists are, are, are certainly implementing those in interesting ways, but I think it's very important for people in the arts um, to take a position these days, which feels very distinct from a lot of postmodernism, which was definitely, um, you know, emphasizing multiplicity, emphasizing ambiguity and emphasizing ambivalence. So that's something that I'm interested to see is artists now taking a position um, whatever that might be. Brandon, do you do you do you have any kind of any thoughts, ideas? Um, well, well, as, as an ambivalence artist, um, it's like uh, I, I I don't know. I think that um, now I'm just gonna like get caught up on that last thing, but. Um, it, I, f I feel like it's, um, you know, it's like so much of our lives. It's like, we know what we're doing. It's like, I eat breakfast, I check my email, you go to the car, you drive to work. Um, and it's like, art is like, kind of like the one place where you can do things where it's like, um, you can do things that aren't like for something else. And I think it's like so interesting, like when, like watching people in museums or in galleries and they're like, so like, what's like, why did you make this? What is this? Like uh, looking like the wall labels and stuff. Um, and it's, it's like kind of wanting this, like, um, I don't know, like explanation or certainty or something. And I'm a, a grad student. I'm also like a teacher and, um, I try to really stress with my students where it's not like, okay, like I'm the fount of knowledge and I give it to you. Um, it's like a lot of this stuff is like open to debate and um, are like active areas of like contestation and um, like how, you know, and kind of like, I think that there's a way of <clears throat> acknowledging that like without, um, like just dissolving into um, like the kind of like wishy-washy relativism. So it's like, so I, I work in like a performance a lot. I have like a performance about Sanbei that I've been working on for a while that um, it talks a lot about 
like the the changes um, along the U.S. Mexico border and in, like the American like Southwest and all of its layers of like indigenous European American history. And it's like there, there is this kind of effort to like denaturalize the border. It's kind of in this like, it starts off in kind of this like lecture like format, but then I start like singing songs like from like Newsies and Rent. I sing like the Santa Fe from both of those. So in kind of like, so there is like a way in which like I'm doing the ambivalence or destabilization work, but I think that it's n- I mean, one could have like an interpretation of my view that is like, you know, like, yay, the US, yay, the border, this is great. But it's like, I think that it's, it's, it's not so much like a denaturalization or position taking, but that um, kind of like giving people the space in which you can like agree with me or like disagree with me. And like, I have an opinion, but I'm not going to be like, you know, it's like, I don't know. I think of, I think of artists as like, I don't know, we're like channelers of like historical forces and um, historical forces are discordant and um, whatever. I also have like a a bunch to say about like institutions in that conversation, but um, I got sidetracked. It's true. We, I mean, we can definitely revisit that, the whole kind of institutional play. And generally, I'm curious, and I, again, I don't know if we'll have time to, to really dive into it, but I'm curious about the structure and something we, you've mentioned earlier, you guys mentioned earlier, um, the change of it in terms of the play of the galleries, the play of institutions to a certain degree, and that, uh, I guess, interaction between the artist and the viewer how that has just changed. And even, you know, once, not if, but once we go back to whatever that norm is now, um, how that kind of the infrastructure of the cre- of the industry generally, how that would um, yeah, help us or not to, to, to build on that kind of interactions, I guess, with audiences. Um, but, but that we could, yeah, hopefully have time um, later on diving into the actual which Brendan you started off talking about in terms of kind of the the, the uh, creative process Andrea over to you um, in terms of how you know obviously the past year how it's impacted um, the, the your your creative process what your kind of what you've you know found out what was a revelation for you during this time um, and and how it changed for you um, as, as a sort of introduction I should say Probably in the last six or seven years, I started to predominantly work site specifically outdoors. And that was obviously, and that was, yeah, last year, it, with it being impossible to travel, that sort of put a, put a, you know, put a reset button on the way I, yeah, assess going forward. But what I have realized is that it also, in a way, for me, the last year has also been an incredible gift of actually just focusing, centering, being in the studio alone and having the time to just potter around without thinking, oh, you know, this needs to be finished, it should be, and, you know, being constantly in the sort of, yeah, in the sort of day-to-day of being, trying to be productive, but also trying to be on top of things and sort of thinking ahead and planning. And I suddenly had the gift of time. And I have to say, I spent, in one way, I think the first part of the sort of um, pandemic I was, I guess, in some way really disappointed that my project didn't take place. And then afterwards, it became very liberating because I thought, you know what? I have this time and I can, have, you know, there's no pressure what I'm going to make. No one will come for a studio visit. I can actually just be in the studio and potter around. And with the, you know, and also interestingly, with it being difficult ordering materials, I sort of reconstructed, deconstructed old pieces that became something else, household stuff came to the studio. I sort of just realized it sort of brought me back to a very playfulness of working without constantly, you know, reassessing, re re, re sort of evaluating if it's any good or if it's not good. I actually just played. And I have to say, in terms of that, I had a really good year because I finally sort of, it felt like I went back to the starting point of why I actually ended up, why I ended up studying art. 
But a lot of that I realized, yeah, along the way, you know, you sort of constantly evaluate and you constantly cross-reference. And I just stopped doing all that last year and actually just played. And it, as such, even though I was a disappointment that the project didn't take place, the ones that then did take place were outside projects. And it was, yeah, I mean, to be honest with Freeze, um, the art fair being cancelled in London in October, um, a curator that I know ended up at very last minute organizing in Hampstead Heath, one of the local parks, uh, an outdoor exhibition, uh, very much as a sort of a guerrilla project because she couldn't get, she couldn't get a permit for it to be an exhibition. So she just did it as sort of a, a two day event. And with a group of 15 artists who are, were ending up hanging, you know, artworks and installing artworks in the middle of this sort of foresty park. And the encounters with, I have to say, the encounters with people that were just there walking in the park because it's a pandemic and there's nowhere else to go than the park was incredibly refreshing. Because I also think there is the element when once you take artwork out of the context, you you get you know you get different dialogue and different reactions and I realized people were incredibly grateful just to encounter things which probably was very much pandemic related because there was so little encounters as such taking place but I also realized yeah it is about thinking outside of the box and just you know in a way yeah I'm trying very I'm sort of what I've taken from that last year I finished on that is to keep that element of playfulness before I start censoring and reassessing and sort of reevaluating if, you know, where it fits in my sort of theme of work, but just keep an element of playfulness because that is the reason why I, yeah, started doing what I do. Yeah, go. Can I, can I say something? Um, so, um, so, yeah, so I've been, I've been involved with um, some like organizing around um, the Long Dream, which was like a museum uh, exhibition at the um, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago that a lot of um, artists were withdrawing from <clears throat> in protest to some of the stuff the MCA was doing um, during coronavirus. And I think that it's like the pandemic has made, I think a lot of us realize that um, it's like something that we like should have known either we learned it and we didn't know it or we already knew it and it got reinforced, which is that these institutions are not here to like, um, to protect us or to, to help us. Um, so it's like, at the, when push comes to shove, it's like they, they have their, um, their bottom line and um, their image is like their like fundamental concern. So it's, so I think that it's like, there's, um, there's been something I, I agree with with a lot of this around like you know in this this gulf that opened up where you know people weren't um ch it, it became like kind of impossible to be chasing all of the like art world clout things because it didn't exist and we kind of um I don't know it's like a lot of my friends it's like I've it's like we've been like you know one of my friends is making these really great, like, but kind of like high schooly type drawings. And a lot of us are, I think, kind of like um, regressing to this like earlier space of the kind of um, like art that doesn't look, that doesn't feel like it's being looked at, <laughs> like things that are just um, being made. But I, I also don't want to, um, you know, it's it's like so I've been like studying clown <laughs> during the pandemic and it's like clown it's like you like work with like you work with the constraints the constraints are like productive um so I'm like I'm very uh, um I'm, I'm totally on board with like you know it's like I can't just have this time be like you know shit or like a waste because it's just like too depressing so I have to like find a way to like make it like make me feel like I'm learning something or gaining something from it. But it's also like, this is like a fucked moment. <laughs> and I don't like want to, um, you know, give into this kind of like, like toxic positivity <laughs> where it's like, it's like, okay, yeah, we can like, we can be in our studios and like, that's really great and not, not doing like the rat race, but it's like, like who has a studio? <laughs> it's like, who is affiliated with like, 
in any kind of institution that they can at least like kind of <laughs> like grovel to for support. So it's like, like I'm a, so I, as I said, I'm a grad student and there was some emergency funding that was like made available and I needed a new computer because mine was like crashing all the time. And when I was campus was open, I could go check out a computer. And so like I put in a request, um, they were like, congratulations, you've been like, here's like a loan for this money you requested that you need to repay in 60 days. And I was like, okay, like, thank you. Uh, I'm not going to have more money in 60 days than I have now. So, and then there was some like angel, <laughs> like in the, you know, Burasar's office who was like, I'm canceling your application, resubmit it, asking for this amount instead. And I did. And then I got the smaller amount. So, but it's like, um, it's like, you know, it's like, having access to this to these kinds of institutions is like a privilege and there are things that come along with them um even if i think that at the end of the day they don't have our best interests at heart um but even you know when you are affiliated with them when you're trying to get things from them it's like sometimes it um and it's like why God, it's like I've been watching these things about like happiness on like YouTube and you'll get these like happy countries like on Mark and like Norway and whatever. And it's like, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like, oh, I'm like, I'm like in this office shop and I hate it and I like quit and I can because there's like employment benefits, which are like, like actually like it's like the way we're living right now with these like increased like wealth with these like increased unemployment stuff this is just like i feel like this is just like what it's like to be like a european <laughs> in like a lot especially in these like nordic countries like a lot of the time um Wait, and it's like no, you can brandon, brandon yeah, hang yeah. on a second we will I'll tackle stop, stop. we will tackle this very soon i hope i just want to get through um hallie and um scott to talk us to talk us through their practice quickly and then we'll really dive into the structure of this whole world and how we can make it more you know inclusive and better working and really it's all about seeking answers with this with this panel so hopefully we'll we'll figure something out of what we all can individually contribute to really make this kind of transition i guess easier on most artists out there right at whatever level they're 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 working at but Hallie maybe over to you of how you found this whole process with isolation or you know was it beneficial was it a complete disaster how was it for you I'm, I'm still here so not a total disaster <laughs> Good. Um, yeah I mean I, yeah, there, there's like a way in which I well, whatever, I'll, I'll agree with Brendan when we get to the agreeing with Brendan portion of the talk um, but I, I think very, very much like what Andrea was saying, I had this sudden gift of time. And um, <clears throat> I mean, prior to, no, I'm not going to go down that route because like, it's more into talking about the larger economics of the world that is still somewhat screwed. But um, yeah, I, I found it really amazing to be in the studio. And, and like I was saying earlier, there were certain things that I just couldn't possibly make because they do require certain facilities that I, I don't have access to or, or can't afford to purchase for myself. Um, and so I think what really shifted for me was a, a, a scale of working that became really intimate. And I, I mean, one of the nice things is that I got to work with ceramics, which is something that um, I have never really worked with um, other than maybe in like an after school art program in grade school. Um, because I always thought it was, it was too much to take on to, to understand how to make play and, and how to learn how to hand build and glazing and like ugh, this whole sort of craft side of it that that can be really intense especially if my partner is a really intense ceramicist so I felt like very judging to have him next to me but um because of the gift of time I was able to take it on and, and I feel like it's been a really wonderful experience to to work at an actual smaller scale and um, you know, also to have this new material sort of in my vocabulary because I think it actually makes a lot of sense for me in, in many ways. Um, it's, it's a wonderful material with a lot of potential ram ramifications in terms of how I work. Um, and then also, I guess, sort of lastly, I'll say I, I think it became such a wonderful material to work with during the past time because it was so not like anything on a computer screen. You know, it was such direct mush, mush, mush to make the thing um, in a way that, that really felt like a refuge to me. Um, and I guess maybe I'll say sort of normally my practice really moves back and forth between analog and digital. I 
pretty much always end up with like a real physical object in the end, but the process of getting to that often involves 3D modeling and you know, maybe some sort of a digital fabrication somewhere in the mix, even if it's just to model something, to 3D print it, to cast it into aluminum, to then grind away at aluminum for two weeks to clean it up. Um, and so I, I think, you know, this just really, this past year really eliminated that part of the equation in a way that I think was necessary because so much of the rest of my life was digital. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Scott, do you, do you want to share some of your experiences over the past year and how it's been? Oh, are you, you have actually a thing to share with us. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. Well, I mean, I think actually a, a few things that I heard along the way uh, from Andrea and Hallie about uh, their experiences were sort of connected to mine too. I mean, um, one is I think I um, got more interested in play again and maybe not so serious uh, about, you know, having to sort of get things ready for a show or what have you. But um, also, I mean, my, my practice is uh, a mixture of digital and analog. I'm a painter, but I make my painting, I design my paintings on the computer and I make, um, models basically and make um the paintings from there so i work uh, my studio's in my house and so if anything i think i worked more on my 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 practice uh um so that so that was interesting um but uh one, one of the first things that happened was i got invited to um, create visuals for uh this microtonal music festival and uh, the Del Sol Quartet was um, asked me to uh, participate in that. And so um, I, I have been working on anim animations really more like sort of on an individual level. I would, I would make the work and think about it and think about the sort of sound component. And then often I would hand it off to a friend of mine who was a musician, uh, Michael Arneo, and he would uh, make the sound component, but this allowed me to, uh, and unfortunately there isn't sound, but um, this, this sort of changed my way of working and I thought it was a really interesting re uh, thing and I really um, started to get can we, Sorry, can we, can we actually see the, 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 the images? Are you, or will you be kind of scrolling down? Because we're just seeing the first one. You're just seeing what? We're just seeing the opening image. Oh, if you just go through, yeah, there you go. If you, if you just. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, that's, that's a drag. Okay. Unless, unless, hang on, unless you want to um, um, start it as a slide. Yeah, let's see if I can. So you don't see that? The next slide? No, I think you need to manually kind of go through them. Yeah, I am actually. The one we can see is the Facebook Live. The shelter in place. Oh, you can see that? Yeah, yeah. I can. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, um, I guess the video is not going to work, but um, I was asked after that, uh, that was like sort of right at the beginning of the pandemic. And um, after that, Sam Weiser, who is the violinist in, um, in the Del Sol Quartet, was going to have a live, a Facebook live performance. And he asked me, to do a visual for that. And so I had been taking a lot of walks in this Frick Park, which is near where I live, and I found this natural shelter. And so I decided to use it for, for that. Um, and from there, you know, I got a lot of, uh, a number of other friends uh, reached out to me. Uh, one of my best friends who I grew up across the street from uh, who plays music, he asked me to uh, create a music video as band Chino had just been signed to a record deal in Philadelphia. So um, I uh, created that. And then another friend of mine uh, who I went to uh, 
was in grad school with, he reached out and was doing a project uh, called the Green Garden Sessions, Eli Pollard, and he asked me to uh, be one of uh, a number of animators to to work on his project, which was basically a dialogue between he and his wife. So uh, all of those things kind of happened. And, um, you know, that, that it, w- even though I was obviously isolated, I started to kind of have more interaction in, in, ter- in terms of like an artistic collaborations started taking place. And so that, that was a, a really sort of beneficial thing. And I, I've continued to work on that for sure. Um, but anyway, it looks like my, my visual isn't working too well. So I'll stop sharing. We could, we could I'm sorry about that. We could, um, if you want to post uh, the link maybe to your website that, that those who are here can see, um, can log in whenever we're done um, to get a feel for it. But we did, we did manage to, 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 uh, to get, to get an idea of a couple of these works at least. Um, but we're still out of time and super behind. So it's been an appalling moderation from my end, but if you guys are all fine with sticking around for five to 10 more minutes, because we, we, we really, I'd love to hear Jessica, your take on just generally how we can re, um, uh, reform or re-jig our terminologies associated with this whole kind of post-postmodern era that we're in or are about to get into, um, and and that might nicely lead us to getting you Owen back into the discussion as well of just this structure that Brandon started um, uh, mentioning or started talking about earlier on, um, and how we could you know, maybe again, shift the structure to better suit the creatives out there given, you know, in, in our kind of, in time of need, basically. Um, so Jessica, I don't know if that's kind of um, enough to, for you to get started on the terminologies. It's a, it's a big question. And it's like questions about time tend to make me go long. But I think that the terminologies we have for art, you know, early modern, modern, postmodern, post-postmodern, contemporary. These are all kind of arguments that continue until the next generation kind of misses the argument by trying to keep up with the most contemporary information, right? And so we're always having these conversations within art history that come from a very specific art historic trajectory that has been largely exclusive for the majority of its time, right? In different communities and different places, modernity means something entirely different. Um, recently, I've seen a lot of articles where people are picking Frederick Jameson back up and thinking about the idea of parody, right? Like a, a repetition of a, a symbol, a strategy, and an aesthetic as a form of critique. And then contemporaneity perhaps being the pastiche. And then somewhere in between, the pastiche b- births itself from the postmodern, the post-postmodern. But I think that those categorizations miss out on so many other people that also kind of in people's gendered imagination, racial imagination, locks people into whether or not they can be contemporary, be early modern, be modern themselves, be representative of these things that come from a very niche institutional closed room conversation. What are we going to call this era of art? And so, um, like I said before, like, I agree with Brandon. I don't want to make this a moment where it's like, everything is great. It's like, no, things right now are very unstable, very scary. I think that's why Owen is seeing a whole lot more work in this kind of tamping, you know, leaving out of the pandemic pandemic where people are trying to define things. This is what I do. And this is what it represents. And this is, this is who I am. Right. Um, which is, you know, very similar to, uh, you know, like, like the art in the World War II, after World War II, like that aesthetic, people really trying to define, you know, like this concrete thing, thinking about what photography did during the Great Depression as well. Like these moments of chaos cause people to produce things that need certainty, right? But in labeling the way that we do, we exclude the world and modernity, post postmodernity, um, contemporaneity, I think are ways for us to continue having productive arguments. Um, we have this time right now where everything seems to have been, it's like if you took a tablecloth and threw everything into the air and we really 
are interested in seeing how things land before we go forward with doing what we want to do, right? Like Forbes recently released an article that was like jobs and institutions and businesses are having to cater to people who want jobs or people aren't taking the jobs because they don't like the new standards that are happening or whatever. Um, they don't want the re-implementation of certain kinds of standards. And I think that that's what we're going to see in the art world, perhaps, too, to a different scale and in different manifestations. Um, I hope artists can 